Let's just give Sue a moment. She's got something she just wants to share with us while the children leave. Yeah. I just want to praise God for how he deliver us from the evil of this. Okay. I just want to praise God wholeheartedly for, for what he's been doing in my life. Um, anger and anger destroys you right down to the core and the evil one will not let you go. Over the years I've been suffering from anxiety. Um, the Lord has always been there but I have a, I can be very obstinate and try to go my own way. But just recently the Lord spoke to me. I've been having issues at home. Um, I know my sister-in-law will not mind me mentioning it. But two women in the house is not easy to go, you know, it's not easy to live. By. I wanted to live, I wanted to run my own house because I've always done it. And my sister in law came to live with us. She was fine, but I couldn't handle it at all. So, over about the last nine years, I've just been battling and battling with it. And it doesn't do your health any good. But the Lord spoke to me the other day. And I just knew it was the right time for me to sit and talk with my sister-in-law. And it was absolutely tremendous. I mean, it's as though a, a heavy cloud is lifted from the house and I just love being in the house, whereas before I didn't enjoy the house. We've got a lovely house, um, and, but I wasn't appreciating it because of this cloud that was um, uh, taking me through the bad times. But it was a, a learning curve and you don't realize how the Lord is there all the time leading you. It's a real battleground, but we were able, I called her into the dining room when we sat down and I said, I wanted, some, I wanted to, to you know, say something to you. And I, uh, I apologized to her because she's had to put up with a lot with my anxiety and that sort of thing. And now it, it's absolutely amazing um, how we just, you know, we. we it's just, I don't know how to put it into words, but it's absolutely tremendous. But the anger, the anger that, can, that the evil one uses against you to take you away from the Lord, he's so powerful, you don't realize, you know, what he's doing to us. We have to love one another. We have to guide one another, support one another. We all have our issues, but Lord... You are absolutely wonderful how you just guide us and every issue and I just love being at home now. And whereas before my, my whole being was governed by anger, I had nothing else, it was taking me away from being able to um, put my thoughts and my love towards the law as it should, Lord, as, as it should have been. But now I can do that because the cloud has been lifted. And she is a born-again Christian, and she's been amazing how she's stood by me. Um, that doesn't mean to say we're not going to have um, issues, but I know I can go to her with anything now, and she will support me, and I will support her. So I just want to praise God for his, his love. It's tremendous, you know, 
absolutely amazing. And I feel all funny now. <laughs> Thank you, Fresbro. Thank you for your obedience, Sue, in sharing that this morning. I think it was absolutely spot on timing wise. And um, yeah, amen. The Lord is speaking to us. There's no time for us to be holding on to anything in our lives, friends. Eh? Jesus has was prayed, Father, forgive them. If they know not what they do. Forgive us our sins, Lord, as you know, for, as we forgive those who sin against us. It's 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 and it will block, exactly like Susan said, it'll block that flow to the Lord if we don't get these things right. Amen? So let's really lay this to hold. Well, I believe the Lord is speaking to us very clearly this morning in the prayer time and everything, and the, and the message this morning is your first love. Please, very quickly, if you can turn to, with me to uh, Revelation chapter 2, please. Revelation chapter 2, and it, it just, I, I felt the timing was right, as I said last week, for us to go back into the book of Revelation, and last week the question was, do you know Jesus? And this amazing description in the Bible of Jesus, as John saw him, the beloved disciple, and yet even this beloved disciple, how he would fall at his feet as dead, and the Lord would say to him, do not be afraid, I am the first and the last. And he gives him this amazing insight. John, the beloved disciple, gets an amazing insight into end time things, friends. It is a prophetic picture that has been given. It's a prophetic book, the book of Revelation. And the other person that in the Bible, as far as I'm aware, that is also called greatly beloved of God is the prophet Daniel. And he too received an amazing insight into the things of the end times particularly concerning the people of Israel. So there's something to be said for those who are beloved of God. And that makes you question, isn't it? Well, does God have favorites? <laughs> you know, and we might think that. But I think of it like this. You know, that scripture that says, where God says, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. As much as you draw near to Father, he will draw close to you. And you will be like he's one of his beloved. Amen. <laughs> and I don't think there's any limit to that. And it's only up to you and, to, and, and myself how we draw close to the Lord. So I'm just going to read from Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. And we're going to look at a few things as the Lord would lead us this morning. Let me just pray and ask the Lord to help me this morning. So Father, already I feel like we, we can almost already just say thank you for speaking to us. And we just want to lay hold of these things, Lord, that you are sharing with us and you ministering to us and you're speaking to your church. And Lord, I just thank you for these precious moments. And I pray that we would lay hold of them. But Lord, as we come to your word, just very briefly this morning, I pray that we would have ears to hear what it is your spirit is saying to each and every one of us. Not my opinion, not my views, not man's voice. We want to hear you, Lord, as you speak these things to the churches throughout the ages. And here we find ourselves, 2022, in the midst of great turmoil and uncertainty. And yet your word is here and alive for us. Help us to see what you would say to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So John sees this and uh, a clear instruction from the Lord. And it says, To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, 
which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Thank God for his word and thank the Lord Jesus for giving these words to John, the beloved disciple, so that we were able here this morning to claim this blessing in Revelation 1 verse 3 that says, Blessed is he who reads those, uh, reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. We can claim that blessing by faith now. Amen. It is a blessing for the church to look into these things, including all those uh, uh, difficult passages concerning the wrath of God being poured out on this earth. It is a blessing for the church to read these things and to be forewarned about these things and to draw us back to him. So now remember, I don't want to go into the whole background of all these churches because there are so many studies out there for you to have a look at. And we've done this before uh, in the church. But just as a very quick, brief sort of overview, John is absolutely writing to seven local churches that were alive at that time when he wrote this, around about AD 95, 96. So this we're talking like second generation Christians already. Okay? And he's writing to this church in Ephesus, and they were all quite closely dotted together, if you like. And it's interesting because these weren't the only churches that were around at that time. There were many others Jesus could have picked to write to. Corinth, and you know, think of other churches and fellowships that were there. But these are the ones that the Lord wanted John to write to. And I, you know, there's many different views as to, to what exactly you know, Jesus is, is, is the message behind that. Some have said it outli outlines church history, which you can sort of see uh, I think it sometimes can be a danger with that is we only put them then in church history. These churches represent all churches throughout the ages because anyone who's got an ear this morning can hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches, yes? And I actually believe it is particularly, particularly because this book is focused on the times of the end, I think all of these seven letters are particularly relevant to churches that will exist in the last days because I believe things will come full circle. And so we've got to take heed. This is a very, very important message for us to understand. And it's especially in the front of the book, before it gets into all the end time things we like to focus on, all the wrath of God and the seals and the horses and all these things, this message to the church is what we should lay hold of, yes, and get the message from it. So this is the, to the angel of the church at Ephesus, or the messenger to the church, Whoever that may be, some people say it's like the pastor of the church was an actual angel. Nevertheless, somebody's got to deliver the message to the church. And this is the message that is given to the church at Ephesus. Now, just again, remember, Ephesus is not like a new church by this time, second generation. And we read of them in the Bible. In fact, Paul wrote a letter to them, the letter to the Ephesians. Yes, we know that. We know even Timothy as the pastor in Ephesus. So they're well-versed, if you like, in the Christian walk. And here is a letter that they receive, these second-generation believers. To the angel of the church at Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Remember, that was the description we saw last week, that Jesus said to John, The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels or messengers of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Now notice the imagery there. Jesus has got his messengers in his hand. And if you look under the original writing there, it's like he's got a firm hold on them. And he is speaking to the seven churches. And these seven golden lampstands, your mind will be cast back to Leviticus 25. I remember years ago we looked at the, the menorah, uh, the whole... You know, all the symbolism around that and the light that it gives in the temple. And it's a, but it's, it's, it's an image of a lampstand. It's, it's supposed to give light. It's, a child can understand this. <laughs> so in the seven lampstands are the seven churches, complete throughout history, meant to be a city on a hill. Yes, shining forth its light. It's a lampstand, shining forth the glory of God. All of that sanctuary around the, the, the original menorah, if you like, was all gold-plated. It was So you can imagine the light bouncing off all the shiny materials all around, reflecting the glory of God. That is what the church is meant to be, <laughs> shining forth the light of the Lord. And Jesus walks amongst these seven golden lampstands, and he encourages them. He gives them a great word here. He says, I know your works. 
I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Paul says, do not grow weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. In Galatians 6, he tells us this. But you know, Paul the apostle had a very moving word for the people at Ephesus in Acts chapter 20. Please have a look with me. In Acts chapter 20. from verse 25, and he's speaking to the leaders of the church at Ephesus many, many, many years ago, the first generation believers. And do you believe, well, I don't want to ask, I want to say as a church, we believe in the prophetic word, amen? We believe that God can speak a word of prophecy even from amongst us as he does sometimes, as we sing in the spirit and we, uh, you know, abiding in his love, the Lord might give somebody a prophetic word that speaks right into the here and now or into somebody's life. And here we see this in practice in the early church. And Paul, the apostle, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and filled with grief and compassion for the church as he was being led away. And he knows what's coming his way as an apostle, going into prison, and ultimately he'll be killed. And it says in verse 25 of Acts chapter 20, it says, And indeed, now I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, will see my face no more. This was a goodbye that Paul is giving the church leaders at that time. And he knew in the spirit, this is the last time you are going to see my face. And he is, as it were, sad. And there's a really sad moment taking place there. Then he says, therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of of all men. For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Not just the bits we like. All of it. And Paul could hold his head high here and say, I have done this. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the, Holy, uh, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his blood. You know, any church leader has got to remind themselves of this all the time. When you see the church of Jesus Christ, they don't belong to you. <laughs> You see, they don't belong to any pastor or any church leader. Jesus bought them with his own blood. What a reminder. His personal possession. And then he says, verse 29, For I know this, that after my departure, says Paul, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, Men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. If somebody gets a prophetic word like this, my friends, for a church, and they foresee the dangers that are coming, and they are pleading with those. It is with tears, it's with anguish, it's with pain. It's not a pleasant thing, if you like. And yet Paul foresaw, under the leading of the Holy Spirit, that even among them people would arise that would lead many people astray. And this was the warning that was given uh, to the people, the leaders at Ephesus. And here Jesus commends them, second generation, that they've done well, praise God. (laughs) These false leaders arose, these people from within rose up, and they tried to lead people astray and lead them away from the church and away from the truth, but they spotted it, praise God, and he commends them for it. Well done, church at Ephesus. (laughs) You've done a good job. And there is no shortage today, even in our time, many false prophets, false apostles, people that are, are not called of God, yet doing the work of God, if you like, and meaning, leading many people astray, down all kinds, of, and we, we know this in our time. And so we need to be like the church at Ephesus, to hold that intact, yes, to make sure we can spot the false apostles and those that are wrong and are not keeping to the word of God. And Jesus said, how will we know them? Know them? By their fruits, yes. So you've got to know them personally. 
You've got to know them personally, not just on the other side of a screen. This is so important. But they did really well in this. And, they, and it says, and, and you've persevered, verse 3, and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. My friends, this is something <laughs> that catches us all out at times. We become weary. We become tired. And nine times out of ten, it is because of our own wrongdoing, because we've got wrong relationships. We're engaging in work that we are not called to do. We're busybodies. We're here, we're there, we're everywhere, except where we're supposed to be, doing the work of God. And here, Ephesus, again, they could hold their heads high. They've done well. They've done well. They've not grown weary. They know what is waiting for them on the other side. But here is the great heartbreak, if you like, for this church that is doing so well. And I want us to see something very clearly here this morning, and I believe the time is right. Because you'll remember probably a few months ago, the Lord led us through the whole, or parts, big chunks of the book of Song of Songs, of Song of Solomon, yes? That great love story that I believe encapsulates the whole message of the Bible. An absolutely amazing book found there that some people find uncomfortable for various reasons, but it highlights this intense love between the beloved and the bride. Jesus and his bride, I believe. The body of Christ, the church. Where are we? We are his bride. <laughs> and he loves us. And he cares for us. He laid in his life for us. And ongoing... He nurtures and he cares. He walks amongst these seven golden lampstands, my friends, that represent his churches. He cares. He loves. He comes and he speaks words of encouragement and he speaks words of exhortation and pleading with them to repent of the things that are not right. And here he says to them, despite all these other things that they've done and they're doing well, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Now, anyone who's been in a romantic relationship for some time, you've been married, <laughs> we can relate to that. That first, well, they've written songs about these things. You've lost that loving feeling, you know, <laughs> mushy, mushy stuff <laughs> people write in heartbreak. But this can happen in our earthly relationships, and it can become work. And we forget the actual love that is there. And nobody wants to be in a relationship where it's just downright work all the time. Even between parents and children. You could have perfectly well-behaved little angels in the house. Awesome. <laughs> but which father or mother wants that and have no love? They are just doing it out of fear and there's no love and there's no relationship, you see. And this is something that God has put into us as human beings, this relationship. We're not like animals that just run on instinct. We're made in his image. And something about these things that we see, anger, love, rejection, all these things. God relates all these things. When you read, the, you know, when Israel goes astray, he likens it to an adulterous wife. And any husband can just try and imagine that horrible feeling when somebody has been unfaithful to you and people that have been through this know what this feels like. Deep anguish. And God likens it to these very deep human feelings and so much more from his side. And here we see Jesus says to this church, nevertheless, I have this against you. You have left your first love. Wow, friends, right from the start. Somebody prayed it this morning. Hear, O Israel, this is from Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Right from the very start, that was God's desire for his people. A love relationship. Adam and Eve walking in the garden. What sweet fellowship they had with their father. And this was God's desire, even through his people Israel. Bring them back. It's a love. It's a love, and this morning we were even just praying and you know, reminding ourselves God's very nature is love. And you know, 
In Psalm 51, don't have to turn there, where, 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 where David cries out. Remember when he repents after the sin with Bathsheba and Prophet Nathan you know, called him out on it and, he, and his heart is broken. And he says, restore to me the joy of thy salvation. Bring me back to that place of unity with you again. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. I want that relationship restored. Against you and you only have I sinned. You are all that matters to me. Have a look with me just quickly at 1 John chapter 1, please. Just a few pages back. 1 John chapter 1 verse 7. Hopefully we know this verse. 1 John 1 verse 7. He says, but if we walk in the light... As he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. We read that in the English and we think, yeah, we have fellowship with one another. Because that is what we're called to do as well. Love your neighbor as yourself after loving the Lord your God all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. But I don't believe that's what it's saying here. Here it's saying if you walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. It's that fellowship, I believe, between you and the Lord Jesus Christ. I can't wait for the time we get to that, that, uh, that letter where the Lord gives you that stone, promises that stone with a name on it that no one knows except he who receives it. A very unique relationship he has with us. And we can have this fellowship with one another. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. My friends, this has been the heart of our Lord Jesus Christ. And right here in the very first letter, this is what we see. His desire, come back to your first love. (laughs) Husbands and wives, (laughs) you can think of this for yourselves. You've lost that loving feeling. We're still together. We still live in the same house. We still go to the shop together. We do the things. We, but something's missing. We've lost that loving feeling. That relationship needs to be restored. Do you see? That love needs to be there. And this is what the Lord Jesus is crying out for his church, my friends. And you know, in Song of Songs, I'll just remind you of this again. Song of Songs chapter 2. And we did this together, remember. Song of Songs 2, I'll just read it to you. And he says, in 2 verse 4, he says, He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. <laughs> From the outset, he wants to show everyone, this is the bride I love. His banner over me is love. My friends, his banner over his church is love. It's not changed. Yes, he loves his church. And he sure fights for his church. As we said last time, when Saul of Tarsus went out to persecute the church, Jesus said, why are you persecuting me? Jesus identifies with his body as one flesh. Husbands and wives, remember this. You are one flesh in God's eyes. His banqueting house and his banner over me was love. Sustain me with raisin cakes. Refresh me with apples, for I am lovesick. <laughs> Makes us feel uncomfortable as human beings. What an awesome love story. And Jesus is urging his church, despite all the good things that we can do, and they're good and they're right, don't lose your first love. Don't forget about Jesus your personal relationship with him when you got saved, my friends, <laughs> and all things became new. <laughs> Again, we can only liken it to when we first fell in love. Young people, when you fall in love, you'll know what we're talking about. <laughs> Everything turns to mush, okay? But there's a love here, an awesome love. And Jesus is saying, I have this against you. You have left your first love. And you know, you read the book of Ephesians. You remember the the place where they've been because he says to them, remember therefore from where you have fallen. What? 
And Paul said to the church in Ephesus, what he says, you are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. Church, do you know that? <laughs> We're seated with the King of Kings in the highest places in the heavenly places. What authority we have in his name. If you're the spouse, the wife of a very high official, or let's say, you know, I'm thinking like maybe ancient kings, you know, if you're like a queen, and the king gives you authority as his, you know, as the queen, and he gives you that authority, you go in his name, you have that authority, it's been given to you. And so when Jesus gives us his authority and the things that he tells us we can do, we can do them <laughs> by faith. But they have fallen. And I believe this would have maybe made them think when Paul said to them, we're seated with Christ in heavenly places. And he says to them, repent. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, the better works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Now, here is the danger. Here is the danger. I believe with all my heart that Jesus himself here <laughs> is speaking to these local fellowships, actual geographical sites. And I believe that all over the world there will be sites where the Lord has planted a lampstand for his name's sake. He planted it there. He said, I will build my church. And he says to the church, you go and make disciples. We tend to get that the wrong way around most of the time. He will build his church. He will put his lampstand. And aren't you glad this morning that he's the one who decides when that lampstand should be taken away. I've heard it many times, even over this church, sadly, in my short time here. This is a lampstand removal. Man making a judgment. Jesus decides if it's a lampstand removal, not man. Praise God. And he cares for his church, my friends. But the warning is there. It says, unless you repent, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place. Unless you repent. You've got to see the love of Jesus here this morning, friends. Unless you repent. Of what? <laughs> Not staying close to your first love. All our righteous deeds are like filthy rags in God's sight, my friends. They don't impress him one bit. But obedience. And love for him is what he desires. A broken and a contrite spirit. When you come in that moment and you say, Lord, <laughs> I've messed it up. I'm just coming to sit at your feet. I think the Lord loves that type of attitude. Just like any father would with a child when they've just come to the end of themselves. And they just come fall in your arms. And they just need help. Which loving parent would not give them everything at that moment? Do you see? And sometimes the Lord will use circumstance to speak to his people to bring us back to that place of our first love. And he'll be, my child, where have you been? <laughs> Unless you repent. And I believe the Lord is already speaking to us this morning through these words, friends. There are things that get in the way. There are things that damage our relationship with the Lord. Nobody else might see it. We might hide it so well. And that may be a sin the Lord is putting his finger on this morning, shining his light on something that you're just entertaining in your life, and you know I should not. Or you know, even as Sue was sharing, the Lord speaking to me about that person, that family member. I need to let go. My friends, it's not worth holding on to it's not worth holding on to. You know, the picture I always get is, you know, when I hear sometimes the things we say, and I even say, and how we complain and we whinge, you know, and you think of that day when you're going to stand like John the Baptist, uh, not John, the, the beloved disciple John, as he stands before Jesus, the King of Kings, okay? And we stand before him, and we're going to begin to think how we're going to utter these words to him <laughs> of these complaints that we had with these people down here. <laughs> It's not even going to come into our minds. We're just going to be ashamed. Do you see? He said, I've paid for it all. 
paid for it all. Just come to him, my friends. Today is an opportunity for us to come back to him. And I would just urge you <laughs> that you would take hold of this word. You know, we don't plan these services like that. The Lord is speaking to his church because he is coming soon. And we need to be ready. And Jesus is saying to us, unless you repent. And if a church refuses to walk in the ways of the Lord and refuses to repent, there comes a time where the Lord will remove a lampstand. And Ephesus saw this because history shows us there's nothing there now, just ruins. Where did the Christians go that were there, the genuine believers? I believe maybe they were scattered. They went wherever they went. The true church, he who had an ear, they heard what the Spirit was saying to the churches. And the Lord looks after the individuals. But the church lampstand can be removed, my friends. The Lord can remove this lampstand from this place here. This church was planted here back in the 1800s, I believe it was, by a very wealthy family that gave this, this whole site and, and more that we can even see here for Christian witness. God moved human beings to do this. He planted a church here, put a lampstand here. And you and I have a privilege to be part of that right here. But the warning, like with any other church, if we should get it wrong and not obey, <laughs> he can remove the lampstand, but he wants that love. First, and listen, I find this amazing. This is the first message to the first of the churches, is the love, the return to your first love. And that shouldn't be a difficult thing for us to do because we know the Lord. We have tasted that the Lord is gracious, amen? And we just come back to that, just say, Lord, we're so sorry for what we've made it. We love you and we want to worship you. But Jesus says to them in verse 6, but this you have, so he continues to encourage them, friends. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Wow. Now, <laughs> again, those of us who have close relationships with people, you quickly get to know the things that they love and the things that they hate. Husbands and wives. Yeah, again, you tend to, husbands, stay away from the things that you know your wife hates because it's going to make life difficult for you <laughs> and vice versa. We just There's certain things that some people just don't like, certain type of music or whatever it may be. We all have different tastes about things. And it's part of the privilege and the joy of these wonderful things called relationships that the Lord has built into humanity. That when you get to know people, you get to know what makes them tick, what they like and what they don't like. And we're all different. And that's wonderful. That's good. Praise God. God is a relational being. We can see this. Otherwise, he wouldn't have sent his son to die for us and then he would purchase us by his own blood. Do you see this? He wants a relationship with you. And you can walk with him. You can talk with him. You can have a relationship with him. And you and I can begin to understand what are the things he likes and what are the things he dislikes. In fact, even hates and here's one that comes out in the Bible. And he commends them. You hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And people have looked so hard to try and find out who these Nicolaitans are. <laughs> and it seems to be a bit of a mystery who they are. <laughs> a sect of people at that time that was doing something that Jesus hates. But praise God, Ephesus, they also hated this. And we don't know much about these Nicolaitans, except there's another reference. We'll go just to 2 verse 14, chapter 2 verse 14 of Revelation, because they come up again. And it says, but I have a few things against you. Now he's talking to the church at Pergamos. Because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Thus, you also have those who hold the doctrine of of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. So there we can see a little bit of connection with this doctrine of Balaam, teaching people to eat things sacrificed to idols, committing sexual immorality. It is a looseness in the church of God. And don't we see this in our time today? All under the banner of grace, how we abuse it and people teaching children, doesn't matter how you lived your life today, doesn't matter what lifestyle you choose, it's all covered by grace. You can live the way you want and enjoy life because that's what God's given us here and now. That is so far from the truth. 
Otherwise, we might as well pull the word repentance out of the Bible. Nicolaitans. Some people also believe it's translated or mistranslated or not fully translated word that speaks about those who lord it over the laity, those who who put themselves over the, the, the church, and only they will decide what the church should learn, what they should read, what they should understand. Everything's going to come via these lords of the church. Where have we seen that in history? <laughs> yes, history is rife with that in church history. Roman Catholicism, the one to think of, and many churches today where everything is people lorded over them, and, and, and Peter writes, do not lord it over the people. Lead as examples, shepherd the flock. And, but these are things that we know Jesus said he hates. But there's a scripture I want us to just in closing have a look at this morning from Proverbs chapter 6, because we need to understand if, some, if Jesus and God says the things that he hates, we need to just know a little bit more about this. Remember Queen Esther? When all the girls were dressing and they could pick whatever they wanted to impress the king, what did she, she asked the eunuch for his recommendation. In other words, what does the king like? I want to impress the king. I'm not yet to look good. I'm not yet to do my thing. I just want to know how do I impress my king and do this mission that I'm called to do. So let's understand. And here we see in Proverbs chapter 6 from verse 16, we just see here, these six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. Seven things that we list here. Now, we might think abortion and all these things, social things that we see today, which are they're terrible things. But look at what the Lord says. And remember, we looked at 2 Timothy 3, those perilous times. And we see these are the things that God hates. A proud look. What? A proud look? God hates a proud look. A lying tongue. Hands that shed innocent blood. There we got abortion and things like this. A heart that devises wicked plans. God hates these things. Feet that are swift in running to evil. A false witness who speaks lies. And one who sows discord among brethren. Something of these Nicolaitans would have been touching on these things, my friends. God hates it. And we should steer far away from it. Do not hold to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. I'll just close this letter this morning as our time is up. Because next time, by God's grace, we want to look at the persecuted church. Jesus says in verse 7, as he says to all the churches, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Now, we don't have time to go back to Genesis this morning, but you know that when Adam and Eve ate of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that God said, let's, as it were, protect this tree of life unless they now stretch out their hand and they also eat of this tree of life. So they were prohibited and there was a cherubim sent there to cover this forever, for all eternity as it were. But back in the end of the book of Revelation, you see that this temple of God, where the dwelling place of God is now with men, the tree of life is there again. And here's a promise from Jesus who has won the victory on the cross that he, my friends, will give those who overcome to eat of the tree of life. What an awesome promise. We don't even entirely know what that means. But it has been hidden from humanity all the time since the fall. But Jesus, the lamb that was slain before the foundations of the earth, holds the authority and he can say, I can give to you to eat of that fruit of the tree of life. Life eternal in his name. My friends, the Lord is speaking to his church today. (laughs) Let us be those who hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Amen. I'm going to invite you just to stand with me. I just want to pray with us. I'm going to ask Richard if he's just come, get ready to lead us in a song of worship in closing. But I want us just to, I guess if I could say anything, I want us to go read this again at home. (laughs) Okay. And again and again and again. 
But this morning, if you believe the Lord has spoken to you about that one thing or two things or three things or whatever it may be that is niggling in your heart and you know the Lord is speaking to you, my friends, today is the day to put that thing right. Today is the day of salvation. It says, do not harden your heart. Who knows if we will have another opportunity And I shudder to think, you know, how short this life is, how frail this life is, yet what a huge impact it has on our eternity. Let us not be those that stand ashamed before the beloved because we've got stains on our clothes that we've held on to when he has paid for it all. All of it is paid for. Just let it go. And you bring it to him. So I'll give us just a second and you just stand in silence before the Lord and I'll trust the Lord to lead me in a prayer in closing. Hallelujah. Lord, we confess before you today we are hard of hearing. And how many times in your word you say, hear, O Israel, shema, listen, take heed, watch, pray, behold, take notice. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches, Lord. He who has an ear, let him hear. Yet, Lord, we say to you so often we don't hear. We stop our ears because we're focused on the things around about us when you are speaking to us from outside of time in your love and your grace, and you are showing us, even in our very hearts, the things that you want to put right and calling on us to repent of even this day because they cannot stand in eternity. And in your grace and your mercy, you speak to your churches as you do today. Thank you for the example and the testimony and confession today, Lord, of anger and even, Lord, of holding a hard heart towards somebody close to us. Lord, I know you are speaking to us in this church. And as your word says there, we would put away all malice, all lying, all deceit, all hypocrisy, envy, and slander to put these things away from us and to desire as newborn babies desire the pure milk of the word that we may grow thereby. Bring us back to that place. Lord, we want to say to you today, we love you. We love you, Jesus. We thank you for coming into this world and laying down your life willingly for us to make a way for us to spend eternity with you. Lord Jesus, this day may we come back to that first love. Lord, I pray for anybody here, anybody who's listening that has not tasted and seen your graciousness, that have not come to that place of being born again. They have no idea what we're even talking about this morning. Lord, I pray that you just so prompt them in their very hearts so they may reach out to you today in faith and call upon your name and so call upon your name they will be saved. Lord, as they repent from their old wicked ways and, Lord, set their life on course for eternity with you and that they would experience this amazing love that you speak of here, this first love. So, Father, we pray that for each of us. May your Holy Spirit just so come and fill our hearts even now, Lord Jesus, as we come and praise and worship you in closing, just fill our hearts again with your love as we express our great love to you in faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks.